Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I'm Matty K. Stormageddon. And you're listening to episode 156. And this episode, we're talking about the games that you swear they're not exactly... Are, is this a sequel to a game that I... No, this couldn't possibly, because it's a spiritual successor. A game that, in some way or another, draws implied or explicitly from the developer huge inspirations from great games that came before. Even though this will be out probably a month after release, this conversation is very much inspired by Sea of Stars, a game that Jeff and I are very thankful to have gotten review codes for. Thank you again to Tinsley PR, as well as Sabotage, for providing those codes. Yes. And having spent a ton of time with it, it's fair to say that I don't think this game could have existed in this exact way without games like Chrono Trigger, Secret of Mana, or Legend of Mana, Mario RPG. And it's not because it's copying them, but it's definitely taking heavy inspiration from them, but still making itself its own. And the core of this conversation is talking about why spiritual successors are important. And there are a lot of different ways they come from. We can talk about and we will talk about the Sea of Stars where it's just people grew up playing these games and they were inspired to make a game like it, which is kind of Sabotage's whole oeuvre with both of their games. But then there are also spiritual successors where the original game director or creator can't make that game for that franchise anymore because the company doesn't want to. So they go off on their own to do it, which has had successes and horrible failures as well. And uh, plenty of middlings as well through no fault of anything but circumstance because, yeah, why these sorts of successors occur is, well, the legal arena of franchises, of IP, of copyright get murky when it comes to video games, depending upon whether it is the creator of the concept, whether it is the studio that produces it, whether it is the team that produces it. And depending upon when you look, where you look, and who you talk to, you're going to get different answers as far as all that goes. And I am not a lawyer, so I can't say definitively on any of that. And that's not the research I did for today's episode. But what it means is often we get games that are sort of standing on the shoulders of giants. The great games that came before Sometimes they're great games. Sometimes they are also a company trying to take another stab at a concept that didn't quite land the first time. I also think of a little off the beaten path in a not quite way. This is an example of something that makes you think of it, but I don't think it is, is Infernax, a game that we've talked about before on this show. That is Berserk Studios saying, hey, remember Zelda 2? Remember Castlevania 2? What if they were better? And... I bring this up also because that kind of attitude isn't necessarily a bad thing. There is often an argument or debate to be had about being derivative or about originality. And everything is built on everything. The whole idea of good artists borrow, great artists steal. Whoever said that, I could say whomever and I'd be stealing it. But <laughs> regardless, you can't necessarily copyright a gameplay experience despite what people try to do. And so sometimes exploring a feeling, a mechanism. You can copyright characters. You can copyright environments and worlds. You can't make a sequel to Chrono Trigger. I can't make a sequel to Chrono Trigger. I don't own those characters. But I can try to make a game that feels like it and reminds you of it, not in a way of, hey, remember that time, remember that time, but gives you that same kind of feeling while you're experiencing it. And Sea of Stars is far from the first game to attempt this. For sure. And like, to be clear, we're talking beyond genres. While spiritual successors often live in the genre that they are emulating, mm -hmm. like the previous games they're emulating, they are something that feels so close to that previous game that it goes beyond genre. For example, Shovel Knight, a game we love to talk about on the show, I wouldn't really call a spiritual successor other than two classic Nintendo platforming games. Yes. It borrows from so many things, but still feels... I would say in the only way that it's a spiritual successor to DuckTales is the down attack is like note for note, almost the same with great intention. But beyond that, like the game mechanics are more based on Mega Man, like it pulls from different genres. And I think that makes it more feel like it's playing in the vein of a time period than specifically a certain game. I would call that a loving homage or a love right. letter rather than a spiritual successor. Yeah. Then you look at games like Mighty Number no. 9, which admittedly I haven't played a ton of, but I've played a little of. That was a game where one of the original creators of Mega Man decided, I want to make a new Mega Man game. And at the moment when he decided that, Capcom wasn't. 
So he went off. He had, I think he had left Capcom already at the time. Yeah, I believe he had. Decided to go off and make his own game, and it was kickstarted. And it's one of the more infamous, like, lessons for Kickstarter. It had a troubled development. It ended up not living up to any of the expectations. It took a long time to deliver on its promises and still didn't really. There have been plenty of successful Kickstarters <laughs> since. But like it's, it's kind of become the poster child of not only when spiritual successors can go wrong, but also when indie games and Kickstarter campaigns can go wrong. And yeah. I think it's a good starting point because having played a bunch of it, it's not necessarily a bad game, but is it a great game? No, and I think when you're touting that you're one of the original creators of Mega Man and you're also trying to make a Mega Man-like and very clearly framing it that way, that's a tall order. The Mega Man games are tight and precise, and even people who maybe not love those games can recognize the early tight game design and to want to emulate that but not make a game as tight, as precise for a run-and-gun platformer, which is kind of needed you are kind of digging your own grave a little bit. Yeah, the expectations are a lot higher on that. It's a great example, not just of all the different ways it can go, but the fact that just because you have the original creator doesn't mean the magic's going to be there, which is a nice mark against the idea of the auteur game developer, the idea that all of it stems from one person. Granted, a lot of it can stem from one person, but you need a good team to work with on that. An interesting counterpoint to that would be Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night. Right. A more successful kickstarted game that you can say however you feel about how Bloodstained, Ritual of the Night came out compared to other Metroidvanias of its ilk. I would not say it's a bad game, though. Personally, I really love the game. I freaking love, love it to bits. And it's an example where... Mighty Number no. 9, I feel, got a little too caught up in the story of what it was trying to be, and that slowed down the gameplay. Bloodstained Ritual of the Night definitely has those story moments and what have you, but Castlevania Symphony of the Night definitely had its own overblown sense of drama the entire time anyway. But also, in pulling from not just Symphony of the Night, but all of the other Metroidvania, Castlevania titles that Koji Igarashi worked on, you kind of get a best of. And that's something I love about that title. They're able to go, people like this, people like this, I think this all works together. Let's make a nice package. Is it going to be better than any one of those games? Maybe, maybe not. But I think it's important when making a spiritual successor to make a new experience as well. Small side note, but the only reason I was as down on Bloodstained as I was at the time is when I bought it at launch on Switch, it didn't run well on Switch. It's nope. since been very much optimized. But also, I played Curse of the Moon before, which was its like NES counterpart, a, a Kickstarter reward. Another one that's like, I think Castlevania 3 is going to sue somebody. <laughs> and like, it was, I think, better than the full release of Bloodstained because it, if nothing else, was a tighter, shorter experience. That's to no fault of Bloodstained, and I end up paying into the franchise regardless. Right. I wish Curse of the Moon 2 was as tight, but like, still, very much, these are games that are not just trying to sort of be something, but are absolutely trying to be exactly it on a level, but still making it original and its own. I mean, a game that I think of that's been tried to be copied, especially in the indie space, a ton over the last five years, is Paper Mario. Uh, yes. Specifically, Paper Mario Thousand Year Door, a lot of games like Bug Fables, and there was, um, I can't remember the name of it, but there's this little ghost game that came out that was also very Paper Mario style. The Outbound Ghost. The Outbound Ghost. Which had a little bit of its own controversy, but. Right. But these games have the 2D you know, pixels that like kind of spin like paper without sometimes explaining why they have that look. It's just a design choice. But mm -hmm. even the timed hits, the audience contribution, there's a game coming out, hopefully early next year, Born of Bread, that is also trying to walk in the footsteps of Paper Mario and be a spiritual successor to it while adding its own twists on the mechanics. And I think that's what all of these games have done well. When I played Born of Bread at PAX East, I really loved it because like, instead of there being an audience, like in Paper Mario, you're being live streamed and a Twitch streamer is streaming you and the audience can affect the combat, that kind of thing. But also like Born of Bread, I feel like is more of a Paper Mario like and a spiritual successor because the writing, the comedy, the humor, the heart is all there also. And I think it's important to say, because we haven't yet, the reason a lot of these games come to be is because the big platforms, the AAA studios, the reason it's a lot of indie games that tend to do this is because it's the AAA studios that have the rights to these kinds of things that aren't making those games, right? Mm -hmm. Think about Undertale, which is very much a spiritual successor to Earthbound. And I know that just through osmosis. 
it's because not only did Toby Fox make a Halloween hack for Earthbound, but then also Nintendo won't release Mother 3 here. There were no plans for a new Earthbound game. Right. So he rolls up his sleeves. I guess I'll do it myself. And like, I like that a lot of these games are just born out of fans like us wanting that thing. And since we can't get it, making that thing. I think of something classic and the games that they've worked on, Shadows of Adam and their quartet, which is I've Kickstarter, which is coming, are very much what if Final Fantasy games never evolved? What if they stayed the Super Nintendo turn-based gems of our childhood and were a little quicker, easier to digest, more straightforward? And it's funny because they're making a spiritual successor to a time period of games yeah. Even though that company is making new games and making new turn-based RPGs, your Octopath Traveler 1 and 2, things like that, but still chasing that kind of very specific moment in time. And it's kind of an important point that these companies don't always just want to be inspired by stuff that isn't around anymore. They could be inspired by the past of something that's evolved beyond or shifted or pivoted, which is, I think, an interesting way to look at it as well. Yeah, just because a game was released 20 years ago, 30 years ago, doesn't necessarily mean it's not worth exploring and riffing upon, which is really what I think the more successful spiritual successors do. They bring modern game design, what we have learned over the years of what works or doesn't work, quality of life updates, removing friction in gameplay. Something that was great about Bloodstained Curse of the Moon was you could choose in a difficulty setting to play it like it's an old NES platformer, but in its default state, it was so much more convenient. And you could argue about that to blue in the face, but that's not what we talk about here. And we all know that. But <laughs> it allows for that. And I think if it was only the classic version, it wouldn't have done nearly as well. It just would have been a nice little novelty. But because people nowadays look back on those titles and go, I loved that. Let me make it how I remember it. Or let me tell my story or have my own spin. It's gaming fan fiction. And I mean that as a compliment. Case in point, I actually remembered a game that I played at PAX West that we didn't talk about. There is Arzette, the Jewel of Faramore, that is being released on Limited Run Games. That is a spiritual successor to the Zelda CDI games. Oh, yes, I remember seeing this. It, in fact, has that same sort of wild, unhinged, interactive, animated style of cutscenes when you go up to people. I've never played the CDI Zelda games. So I can't say how they compare or don't compare. But I do know the literature. I do know my history. And they weren't great games. Better than they had any right to be. But they were not great games. Our Zet plays fantastic. <laughs> it's a nice, tight action platformer. I had a lot of fun fighting the boss that I did in the demo when I was at the limited run booth at PAX West. And the animated cutscenes are... Intentionally kind of bad, but in a charming way. And they're not meant to be obstructive. And because one of the other things with these sorts of revisits or re-riffs, you think you're going back to old stuff, and you may well be. But also, sometimes you are giving an idea a chance to thrive in a new arena. When you're playing something on the CDI, how fast was that disk drive? One time? Two times? 4X? Oh my gosh, I don't know at the time. So loading up anything animated, playing new CD audio, you would hear the disc move. You would hear the laser shift. You would have to wait for these things to load. So any tiny cutscene that happened would waste time. And if you accidentally triggered that cutscene again, you've wasted that much time again. But nowadays, whether it's on a Switch cart or on your PS5 or just entirely digital, those things load so much faster. That is another way that friction is removed in revisiting these old games, these old titles, these forgotten gems, these kind of lost ambitious ideas or old favorites like Sea of Stars to Chrono Trigger. Because just because you're aping Chrono Trigger doesn't mean it's going to be a great success. I've never played I Am Setsuna or Lost Sphere, but both were games early in the Switch's life, and they were on other platforms as well, that were touted very much as the, you know, the heir to, to Chrono Trigger. Everything I got from talking to people, from reading about it, was it was too caught up in nostalgia for nostalgia's sake and got a little clunky and got a little caught up in itself. You still need to design with a modern eye when you go back to the well or you try to continue something from the past. 
Yeah, I mean, I played I Am Setsuna. It was one of the first digital games I bought on the Switch because at launch, there weren't a ton of games that I wanted to play. There were a handful. That's when it was tempting to me. <laughs> right, and I didn't get my Switch at launch. I got it like three or four months later. Yeah, it was fine. It didn't leave an impact. Whereas Sea of Stars, I mean, if you've been following me on any platform that I have a voice on, I haven't shut up about. Like, the thing that makes <laughs> Sea of Stars a success, I think, beyond just being very heavily compared to Chrono Trigger, which is one of my favorite games of all time, and does very much do certain things that Chrono Trigger does, even beyond gameplay elements. But like, it also has a compelling story, great writing, really interesting characters. I think what's fun is that the Solstice Twins, you get to choose which one you want to be the actual party lead. It doesn't really affect the narrative at all. Mm -hmm. But they are, while not being silent protagonists, very much are in the vein of silent protagonists, as in they are probably the most cookie-cutter characters in the game. They're not boring by any stretch, but are very much like the, the chosen lead. ones. Right. And it's the other supporting cast, like in a game like Chrono Trigger, that really shine. And like Garl has become the heart of that game. And... <sighs> Not only being just an incredible character and incredibly written, but like being a surrogate, I feel like, for the audience, which was important and didn't really exist even in Chrono Trigger. Garl is the random guy, good friend of the heroes, has no powers to really speak of, but is along for the ride and happy to be there and kind of gives you an in to this world. So I've beaten Sea of Stars and I will keep it very spoiler light, if at all. Garl's story is the heart of the game and they take specific plot moments from Chrono Trigger and yet still make it their own. Hell, there are even stuff that are not that plot related at all that come from Chrono Trigger. There's a moment in one of the later castles, if you don't want to hear about it, skip ahead a few minutes, but it's not plot related, but you fight a minion at one of the castles. He's like a general or whatever, and you never actually fight him. He keeps summoning people for you to fight and then runs away when the battle's over. It is literally Ozzy's castle after you recruit Magus, but with a completely different context. So if you're not a Chrono Trigger fan, you'd never know. But me, who has memorized that game, I'm like, oh my God, they're <laughs> pulling an Ozzy. And it was incredible. It was great. You know, there's a moment I shared on my Twitter where there are two enemies kicking around a third enemy. And it is very much an exact scene from the medieval past that you first go to where two goblins are kicking around a roly-poly. Those kinds of things, I think, are fun nostalgia that just add to what is already a quality game. I think about Sabotage's first game, The Messenger, which again, I'm obsessed with and I love. That game looked like a Ninja Gaiden. And from the trailers, you assumed it was a Ninja Gaiden. And the reason it's not quite a spiritual successor to Ninja Gaiden is A, it's actually playable and beatable, which none of the old Ninja Gaidens were in my How opinion. How dare you? You're right. <laughs> but also, it evolves into a Metroidvania, though I won't tell you how, and that's what kind of makes it not really a spiritual successor because it is doing its own thing. And the line is fine there, but like I think Sea of Stars really accomplishes something that I've really wanted from an RPG for a long time, and yet I have seen a thing that's been a really fun quirk. I'm in a lot of discords talking with a bunch of different folks, Chained Echoes came out at the end of last year. I believe it was the end of last year. Yep. And was also a turn-based, old-school, Super Nintendo-feeling RPG. And there's been a lot of contrast and compare just because they came out so close together. Mm -hmm. And, like, I know folks who loved Chain Echoes, loved the story, loves the combat, and don't really love the combat of Sea of Stars or think the story is slow in Sea of Stars. And it's very interesting because I think, and I've talked about this before, RPGs specifically, when making spiritual successors, it can be so hit or miss because I think those worlds are just so much more detailed than your typical action platformer, which can be, that you're going to latch on to things that other people, it may not be enough or impact them or whatever. And I think that Sea of Stars being the spiritual successor that it is, I think it's very much you could love it if you have none of those contact points. But I will admit that having all of those contact points and loving those games will absolutely enhance the experience in a way that it wouldn't for someone who doesn't have those points of reference. Yeah, and I think another idea with RPGs is the fact that most RPGs, whether well-designed or not, but usually the well-designed ones, are so many things within a singular package. So what it is that draws you in could be different for everybody, and what keeps you there can be different for everybody, and what you just put up with can be different. I'm reminded of after playing through Persona 5 Royal with Sarah... We wanted to play something a little different. We wanted to just change it up. And so like, all right, great. Let's play Later Alligator, which is a more of a point-and-click kind of puzzle-solving conversational game. 
not a turn-based RPG. There is no combat. There's none of that. Very different style, very different pace. Sarah, within the first play session, was like, nope, this isn't it. This is too much like Persona 5. <laughs> and I was like, okay, I believe you, but I don't understand. What do you mean? I don't want to be doing more social stuff. Huh. Oh, we went back later and we've played through later Alligator. It's a fantastic game and it's wonderful. However, if that's what you're going for, if you are pulling from Final Fantasy, from Chrono Trigger, from Persona, from Planescape Torment, there are so many things that are within that. Is it the mood? Is it the graphical style? Is it the gameplay? Is it the pace of the gameplay? I haven't played Chained Echoes yet, but one of the things that Sea of Stars does that makes it feel the most like Chrono Trigger to me is the flow and pace of battle and of anxiety. Whereas Sea of Stars is purely turn-based and Chrono Trigger was ATB, was active time battle, Chrono Trigger did not have any sort of timed hits going on. So I think being able to attack and defend to such a degree within Sea of Stars replaces that idea of having to work quickly or waiting for more than one of your party members' time bars to fill up so that you could do combo techs, so dual or triple techs, because you have those sort of bonded motions and moves within Sea of Stars. But again, you can sit there and kind of go, all right, if I want to disrupt what they're doing, I need to do this. They scale back how fast it needs to happen, but still maintain a certain feeling of flow and twitch gameplay, while also not quite having one party on one side, one party on the other. There is a bit of momentum and location-based as well. There are facets and pieces while also just evolving. But I think whatever the je ne sais quoi of what makes Chrono Trigger's battle system feel like Chrono Trigger, Sea of Stars doesn't ape it, but it matches it. It matches its energy and moves in tandem. Yeah, and I mean, the timed hit stuff I think is also important because timed hits, and they say in the documentary on Escapist, which if you haven't watched, please do, they say that it is directly influenced from Mario RPG. Of Mario course. RPG is one of their favorite games. And other games have had timed hits, but Mario RPG is one of the most famous. It's getting a remake this year. I'm very excited for it. And so, like, I think there's nothing wrong with wearing your inspiration on your sleeve as long as you make it your own. I think among many reasons why Mighty Number no. 9 failed is because it was trying to be Mega Man, but it was also kind of a, unabashedly trying to be Mega Man without actually learning anything. We said with Bloodstain, the reason it worked in a different way is because it wasn't trying to be Castlevania, but combat-wise it was. And like yes. mood, but like it was still its own thing, and they very much worked hard to make it its own thing. Not a spiritual successor, but a game we loved from earlier this year, Romancelvania is obviously trying to be Castlevania in a shameless way, right? Like, you're playing as Dracula, but it's not a spiritual successor because it barely plays like any Castlevania. It's kind of got its own combat, its own flow. And it's hard, I don't know that, like, spiritual successor would be a hard word to use with visual novels because visual novels do have, within its genre, to have a lot of similarities as far as how you progress, the text, the word boxes, the romances, things like that. All these little pieces. But I think that it's just impressive when a game really is not ashamed of its history and very much leans into it. I think there's a lot to love in games like that. And we've gotten to see so many in the indie space, especially I'd say the last 10 years, that it just kind of grows. You know, I think of some of the beat-em-ups we've gotten over the last few years. Like, let's talk about Treader's Revenge, right? A game that we lauded, that we've done a side quest on. Like, yeah. that is a spiritual successor to Turtles in Time. That just, just happens to get to wear the IP. Right. But like when we interviewed them way back when, they said we wanted to create a Ninja Turtles game that you remember it being, right? You, we want it to play like you remember playing, not like it actually plays. And that's very much, I think, the secret sauce to a spiritual successor because they say that in the Escapist doc also, that Sea of Stars plays like you remember Chrono Trigger playing. Chrono Trigger still plays phenomenally, but like they made small tweaks and little upgrades while still making you play like that muscle memory and that latent memory feels like. Because you have the memory of playing those older games, so you don't think about all of the little pieces. But when you play a newer game, even one that apes an older, it is now in the context of the modern day. Then all of those little annoyances, little slowdowns, little hitches rear their ugly head. And unless they are deliberate, and unless they are designed to be there and you work with that in your greater gestalt of what you're doing, 
yeah, it's going to fall apart. And of course it makes sense that Shredder's Revenge would be the best spiritual successor it can be. Matt, what's the name of the, the developer of Shredder's Revenge? Tribute. <laughs> Tribute Games. So yeah. So there's that. There's that. But one that I know I can't speak to nearly as well as you would, Matt, as far as an interesting study of trying to either ape a little too hard or missing the heart or having to evolve to get it more right. We haven't mentioned ukulele yet. That's true. Yeah. Ukulele is an interesting beast because it is in the camp of Bloodstained and Mighty Number no. 9 as a lot of folks who worked on Banjo-Kazooie who are no longer with Rare wanted to make a game like Banjo-Kazooie to the point where it's a main character and a little buddy. The little buddy is a flying animal. Very much like not even cribbing, like absolutely outright stealing with intent. There was no secret about it. It's not a banjo. It's a ukulele. Those are clearly different. <laughs> and like, it's unfortunate because I was very excited for it. I love Banjo-Kazooie. I love Conker's Bad Fur Day. I'm a rare super fan. Like, there's no secret to that. A super uh, fan of rare. Uh, a super, yeah, a super, not a, <laughs> yeah. Punctuation matters. Punctuation matters. But like the game came out and I played it and I was really disappointed because there was some, like we talked about, je ne sais quoi about the control scheme that just wasn't there. And like I've gone back to play Banjo Kazooie. I've not done a full playthrough, but like that was fun and ukulele wasn't. And I couldn't really, our boy was even in it. Shovel Knight was hanging out. Mm -hmm, and like, mm -hmm. still, there was just something about it that didn't feel right. When they made their sequel, Impossible Lair, which then felt like a different Rare game, the Donkey Kong Country series, that one was a lot of fun. I thought they actually did a better job with that one. And that's another spiritual successor where those games are still sort of coming out. They re-released the Wii U one on the Switch, so that kind of counts. Sort of. Sort of. But yeah, it's a bummer that Ukulele, also an early like, hey, we know you want these kinds of games, we're going to make one, didn't sing, and yet... A Hat in Time, which I love, which mm. I also played on the Switch, very much captured that oeuvre in a way that felt better. It controlled better. The interaction was fun. So Banjo-Kazooie is a very purposely cheeky game, just like Conquer is. A lot of Rare's games are. There was something about Ukulele's writing that just didn't feel as sincere as mm -hmm. those other games, whereas A Hat in Time was goofy as hell, but felt sincere. Also, as far as collecting goes and the stages, it all just felt really more interesting and more fun because it was trying to capture Banjo-Kazooie and other 3D platformers, but not so specifically that it felt like one of those games. A Hat in Time goes more the Shovel Knight route where it's almost not even a spiritual successor. It's more just an homage to an era of gaming yeah. and why I think it worked much better. I think a lot of modern collectathons or 3D platformers that ape collectathons when they get it right, it's not necessarily about the things you're getting, even though that is within the what we call the genre. But it's more about the platforming or about the traversal or about how it feels and how that all moves. Again, not having any nostalgia personally for most rare N64 collectathon platformers, going back to any of them is actually a chore for me. Donkey Kong 64 being the worst offender. Sure. If you made the one change of if you could pause the game at any time and change which Kong you were, I don't know if that would make it an incredible game or anything, but it would go a long way towards any time someone goes, want to play DK64, I'd probably be more excited about it. And there's other elements and pieces of that. And so you don't necessarily have to be about collecting this thing or this certain kind of cheeky humor or whatever, but there just has to be the satisfaction of discovery the joy of exploration, the, I don't know, fulfillment of getting the 100 out of 100, whatever it is, but wanting it to be something that presents a unique challenge and doesn't just make you want to break the controller in half. These are all things that are very quintessence, very je ne sais quoi, very, you know, when you know, you know, that are kind of why I love spiritual successors, because they're, again, I am blanking right now, but I imagine if I thought about this for a minute and took some notes and got some of you listeners to yell at me about it, we could think of at least one game that has had three different branching paths of this game is a sp my new game is a spiritual successor to this game because I think it needed more fast paced combat. I think it needed to focus more on the characters. I think it need whatever it was, you can pull that piece from it and any one of them is 
the fungal piece from which you could grow a new colony. You could grow a new franchise. I have not played Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. I'm excited to play it when I do, and talking about it with friends, I often go, oh yeah, no, Bomb Rush Cyberfunk is every piece of Jet Set Radio's corpse that Hi-Fi Rush couldn't scavenge. I love <laughs> Hi-Fi Rush. I yeah. loved Jet Set Radio. This is why I'm excited to play Bomb Rush Cyberfunk. And it pulls a different idea and pulls different facets of it while going off in another direction. And I don't think I need to play these two bad bitches against each other. I just am enjoying more games and more interpretations off of either things that were loved or things that needed another chance. We're giving those games another chance. Yeah. I mean, I think also something to touch on with spiritual successors that we haven't really yet is that some of them have even started as fan games. Most yeah. famously, I think of Freedom Planet on the Switch and Freedom Planet 2, which more or less started as kind of mods of a Sonic game and then grew into their own thing. And it's Sonic Mania if Christian Whitehead didn't get the license. Right. But like also Freedom Planet now in its incarnation is like, what if Sonic but more story and this and that. And like, it is very much its own thing now, but very much is built from the the bones, the framework of a Sonic game. I have this game that I haven't finished yet called Kaze and the Wild Masks. Like it's very much what if Donkey Kong Country, but you were a ninja bunny that got different masks. And like very much does have that Donkey Kong Country platforming feel. And I think that fan games kind of playing in that space and then making things their own I'm reminded of The Forgotten City, which started as a Skyrim mod and then became its own game and actually plays nothing like Skyrim now. But like, you know, the spiritual successors can either grow out of what came before or grow into something new and not really be much of a spiritual successor anymore at all. And it's fun to see that kind of evolution. And again, I think it's just a thing that exists in indie space so much more because the AAA studios aren't making those games anymore. I mean, we think about a game like your game of show at PAX West this year, Anton Blast, which we both oh, yeah. supported, is very much in everything but name a Wario Land game. But like Pizza Tower also, which I've not played, but I've watched clips of, and I know a lot of folks also liken to Wario Land. Nintendo's not making a new Wario Land game. Their last Wario game was Wario Land Shake It on the Wii. It was a 2D platformer animation done by the Shantae studio that does a lot of the animation for Shantae. Yeah. It was very beautiful, but didn't really hit really hard. Wario World before that, which I love, also didn't sell well, whereas the Wario Wear games continue to sell astronomically every time. And so that's where the focus has been, and it's a bummer. But mm -hmm. then that's when a game like Anton Blast, that the absolute pitch was, do you want a new Wario Land? Like, they didn't even sugarcoat it. And what's really fun to watch the growth of that, especially being in the Discord server, is that it is very much inspired by Wario Land, but it is more and more with every step becoming its own thing that I'm just excited to play because it looks fun regardless of where its origins are from. Yeah, and actually one of the funniest things is having more recently played it, it does have those Wario Land influences. It's got Crash Bandicoot. It's got Earthworm Jim. It's got some Donkey Kong Country to it. But as far as Wario Land goes... The one it most feels like is the Virtual Boy Wario Land, and not just because of the fact that there's the jumping back and forth between foreground and background, although that, yes. There is a certain sense of the feel and the momentum, having played both a lot of the Virtual Boy Wario Land and the Game Boy games as well. There's a certain methodical charge, go, bounce, stop idea that is more akin and larger stages and larger levels as well, which the Virtual Boy was doing with fewer stages but larger, versus Wario Land stages, which are short but dense and frantic. And so it's funny that I would say if I had to give it one game, it is a spiritual successor to a Virtual Boy game. And it's not red and black. It's not trying to do any big 3D gimmicks like that or, or what have you. It doesn't have to, to feel like that sort of a spiritual successor. But by God, that was my favorite game on the Virtual Boy, and I don't think I'm alone in that. And it was a game that deserves to escape containment. So yeah. it's yeah. the only Wario Land game that I've not played since release because I don't have a Virtual Boy. A friend of mine did growing up. But, like, it's one Honestly. of the best Wario Land games that you can't play anywhere else because there's just no way to emulate the Virtual Boy. It was just such a unique animal. I, I would love... I mean, we had the 3DS. We could have had it all, <laughs> damn it. But 
Also, Wario Land Virtual Boy doesn't require the 3D effect nearly as strongly as something like Tellero Boxer or Red Alarm would. So right. you might be able to get away with it, but probably emulating it or setting up the platform is all kinds of ridiculous. So here we are. This is also why we need spiritual successors. We should still preserve the games of old, but we also get new experiences because people have nostalgia, joy, excitement about those games of old as well, or getting to discover new games through the old ones. If you play a spiritual successor and people go, oh, but it's based on this, maybe you go back and you love it. I don't know how many people have played the Suikoden series, but when Ayudin Chronicle 100 Heroes comes out, I hope it gets people to look back. I know it is kind of hard to, to get those games, but also Sony does do a little bit of preservation. I don't know. I don't know about that one, but here we are. But it gets people to look and gets people to demand it, if nothing else. I mean, that's a good point, though. Like, friend of the show, Brendan Groom, who I think is the only person on the planet who loves Sea of Stars more than I did, immediately afterwards started playing Chrono Trigger on the DS, mm -hmm. uh, a game he's never played but knows that I love and knows it is very much an inspiration for that game. And, like, that, I think, is from a preservation standpoint, which is kind of the running theme of these recent episodes, like, that above anything else, I think is what's really wonderful is that even though I wish these games were more easily accessible, the right. fact that you could play an older game or a newer game rather, and it inspires you to go try the original. For me, as someone who grew up with a lot of games and have played a lot of these games that are inspired, I am less likely to go back because I've played them already. But for a new gamer, someone who's not played any of these games or played any of these franchises, playing one of these newer games and going, oh, so that's what that game was like. I should go back and play it. I think that's really interesting. It won't always work out well if you're someone who loved Infernax and then go back to play Castlevania 2 or Zelda 2. But like, <laughs> it's still, I think, Fair. from an experiment and experience standpoint, worthwhile. And I think it's fun that we kind of live in this world where these indie creators are making games that then inspire younger generations to go back and check out the things they missed because I have two friends right now playing Chrono Trigger for the first time. Also Eric Van Allen of the Blood God pod is streaming his playthrough of Chrono Trigger and he streamed the trial. And so there's this clip. If you're following fun and games on Twitter, I shared it where <laughs> he is on trial and they say they have a witness. It's like a witness who, and then the guy whose lunch you can eat walks up and he's like, I don't know this guy. He's like, I didn't do anything. He's like, and they talk about stealing his lunch. He's like, oh, no. And it just starts laughing because he immediately knows what he did. And then they show the clip of him stealing the guy's lunch. And, like, Eric has played other old school RPGs, yet was completely blindsided by this. And that's the fun of going back is that it's easy to think these older games couldn't accomplish half the stuff that these newer games do. And it's genuinely just not true. There are tons of those surprises to experience for the first time if you go back. Yeah, watching frogs split the mountain to get to Magus's castle may not have the same graphical gravitas that it did back in the day, but there's still surprises to be had. There's still emotions to connect to, and those are still very worthwhile. Chrono Trigger is very fortunate in that it's a really good game, so that when spiritual successors come out and it gets people to finally listen to us or their friends or whomever and go, all right, fine, maybe I'll try out Chrono Trigger, and it's great, cool. Sometimes a good spiritual successor means, yeah, you don't have to go back and play Castlevania 2 now. You've gotten the Castlevania 2 experience as much as you need it to. Please understand that I love it for its own clunkiness. Now we can talk more about it. Is also very valid. Yeah, I think that while we work to make preservation broadly better, your Bomb Rush Cyberfunks, as we mentioned, like all of these games that are doing things that older games did that aren't easily accessible for those without a computer, I should specify, because emulation is pretty easy if you have a computer, though we don't condone it, blah, blah, blah. Yada, yada. The companies are using emulation to release the old games anyway. Emulation exists. Right, and they're doing it worse than the actual emulators are. But like <laughs> the whole thing is, if you can't play those old games, what can you play? It's the fact that these games exist... AM2R on the opposite end, we talked about on Tales from the Backlog, that is a spiritual successor to Metroid Zero Mission while they were still making Metroid games. It was just this person was like, well, what if I made a Metroid game? And very much because it's so tight and it's also a fan game, like feels like we talked about in that episode, it feels like it would fit right in the Metroid canon. In fact, when I yeah. got my analog pocket, I looked to see if anyone kind of ported it to the Game Boy Advance but it, there is no Game Boy Advance ROM of it, which is a bummer and I think would be a cool thing to have. And I'm sure there's probably a way to do it, but like 
for those of us who care about video game history, want to experience that history. And Nintendo, PlayStation, and Xbox are doing the bare minimum. Admittedly, they still do have large libraries, but it is the bare minimum compared to the amount of games, as we talked about in the Vim episode, that mm-hmm. exist, that are out there. And there are tons of games, like whenever I mention Rocket Knight Adventures, a game I will always talk about, and most people go, who? What? You know, Sparkster. I don't understand. Or Arrow the Acrobat, which is a little more well-known. Like Plock games. Right. Like, unless you're Nitro Rad covering Plock, like, no one knows what you're talking about, and... I wish those were the games that were accessible. And I love when any of those games get a spiritual successor because then you can point to it and go, remember that game I talked about that you didn't know what I was talking about? It plays like that. Go play that game because it's great. Because we all have those games that we love and there's a certain amount of like, okay, how much of this is, is tinged by your nostalgia? It's nice to be able to do those. And it's nice that with things like Kickstarter, there are even ways to bring back old forgotten games one way or another. Atari is releasing physical copies of unreleased or previously unfinished 2600 games. I, at PAX West, bought a copy of Saboteur. I am in the process of moving still, and everything is all boxed up, so I haven't played it yet, but I'm very excited for when it does. A Kickstarter for being able to work with a license of something, something I kickstarted. Matt, I don't think we've ever talked about this. I kickstarted the sequel to Shadowgate. Oh, yeah, you mentioned it briefly, but I don't know that we've talked about it at length. Yeah, the Shadowgate, the point-and-click sort of horror game from the Mac Venture series. Is it a great game? I don't care. I love it, and I have such strong memories of it. And there were plans for a sequel that, beyond Shadowgate, does exist in a form, but it branched off very much. And so, I'm going to get the name wrong, Zajoy, I believe is the name of the studio, that is basing it off of the original plans and then making it work in a more frictionless setting. It's not going to work on an NES, but it will have all of the old NES graphics and you can get a non-working NES cartridge as a display. I didn't get that. If I get an NES cartridge, I want it to work, but it is another way that oddly enough, you're getting a spiritual successor because they're again, looking at the original and going, but what if it went in this direction? So there's so many ways that this can get explored and I think from there, I want to put it to the listeners. Yeah. Obviously, A Sea of Stars is a jumping off point. We're grateful to have gotten to play it. We do have plans for some kind of full review and more um, detailed discussion of it. But Sea of Stars, while I think a lot of games have done the spiritual successor thing very well, the reason Sea of Stars is the poster child for this discussion is very much the core of why I wanted to talk about it is because I think Sabotage Studios really understands we love this game. How do we translate that into a new game? They've done it twice, and they've done it twice flawlessly. Can they continue that track record? Who the hell knows? But like, I hope they continue to genre hop. I hope they continue to build this world via different genres, because I think it's just such a brilliant way to pay homage to the past while letting us experience the future of video games of these kinds. And they do it well. Yeah, and maybe in 10 years, someone will make a spiritual successor to Sea of Stars. Yeah. The riff on the riff, the evolution on the evolution, that's how we get new play experiences, that's how new fans come about, and that's how we stay connected to the history of this media that we love so much. So let us know, everybody. Let us know what your favorite spiritual successors are. What games really deserve spiritual successors? What are your plans for a spiritual successor to a game? The tell me about your dreams of video games. Tell me about your video game idea. You know what? I do want to hear about it. Let us know. There's so many great ways to let us know all of this. You can find us across social media at Fun and Games Pod, whether that's on Twitter, Blue Sky, Instagram, Tumblr. You can email us at funandgamespod at gmail.com. Let us know what you thought of this episode, previous episodes, who you'd like us to speak with, and what you'd like us to speak about in future episodes. If you want a great all-in-one place to see what we've got going on while also Maybe if you have the means and inclination supporting us in a financial way, you can visit our Patreon, patreon.com slash funandgamespod. You don't have to be a patron in order to access most of what we put out there. There is a feed you can subscribe to, so anything we put out, you'll know when it's there. And you can even, if you'd like and you're so inclined, put yourself up on the high scoreboard. And today, the high scoreboard is Alex Lavelle, Case Aiken, Daniel Needen, Roger Reichart, Alejandro Alves, film it yourself, Patrick Edwards, Rob Tremarco, 
Robert Proin, and Sean Bowen. Thank you so much for your support. Please enter your initials. We are going to be actually kind of taking the letters you're working with and sort of we're removing kind of the click between the letters. We think it's really going to work out to just sort of like move on a touchscreen for it. But that works for modern gamers, I think. If you are not subscribed to our Patreon, please do. We are starting to run polls on there. We're hoping to do more writing. Kind of mostly just use it as a one-stop shop. All of my games that I beat, my games that I beat in 2023 list is there as well since I lost it on Twitter. Thankfully, our gaming log on the Discord allowed me to recapture it. But like, we are really going to kind of focus our efforts there because social media is kind of disparate and spreading and falling apart. And we want a place where everyone can find it. But also, the money Money you contribute helps us. It allows us to buy the book of a guest so we can read it. It allows us to invest in live interviews, travel, all of that stuff. And we really appreciate it and are grateful to have those along for the ride, as well as those who decide to join later. You can, of course, join in the conversation on our Discord server. There's a permanent invite link to it in the show notes below, as well as on certainpov.com, which is the podcast network that we are a part of. Please rate and review the podcast. Spotify and Apple links are in the show notes. But any podcast platform you're on that allows you to rate and review, please do. Every single rating and review helps us find a larger audience, new listeners. Also, tell a friend. If you have a friend who really likes video games and listens to podcasts, but maybe you haven't talked to them about this podcast, share it with them. I've found that communities grow much faster when it's a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend. We all have tend to have like interests and engagement, and it would just be fun to grow this community with the people we care about. Yeah, this is a great way to find new favorites, share old favorites, and just keep everything going. We really couldn't do this without you. This is a conversation. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matty K. Stormageddon. And happy gaming. Hey. Oh, hey, Jeff. What's going on, guys? Oh, you know, talking about Superman. Oh, cool. I could talk about Superman. I could talk some more about Superman. We know. I'll bet a few people would want to get in on this. I'm down. You know it. That sounds like fun. I'll do it. Cool. Let's do it. We can call the show Men of Steel. And you can find it at certainpov.com. Or wherever you get your podcasts. Yay. CPOV. Certainpov.com.